All right, I think we are live. Uh, so hello, everybody. Um, Connor here from Gitcoin, uh, my, and I'm here with Milton and Eric from the Cartesi team. So for some context, as many of you probably know, uh, we are midway through the application phase of the Cartesi DAP incubation program. Uh, this is uh, the application phase is, is uh, what, like four week process. I think there's two weeks left um, for people to make proposals of projects they want to build on top of Cartesi. And uh, once we hit the deadline of uh, October 12th, we'll be going through all the applications and picking the top three um, who will receive up to 20K in funding uh, to build their proposal over the next uh, three to four months. Um, and they'll all uh, finish off with a Gitcoin grants round uh, for the best three projects. So uh, we're super excited to see what you guys have, what you're putting together. Um, we'll, I'll drop the link in the chat for the actual program and the application form if you guys haven't seen it. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about um, uh, it, well, we're going to get a hands-on developer tutorial from Milton. Uh, so I guess before we dive into it, I want to hand it off to Milton or Eric, if you guys want to say anything before we dive in, um, and then we'll get started. Hello guys, here is Eric, and I just like to give you a couple words before passing on to Milton. Um, so as Connor said, the deadline for submission is on the 12th. And we highly encourage you guys to try and, and uh, send your application. Of course, you can also uh, use the cart on top of Ethereum, on top of Matic, and also on top of BSC, Binance Smart Chain now. So yeah, so you can, for instance, combine Cartesi with another layer two solution like Matic, which expands on the possibilities that you have at hand. So yeah, so just do it. Uh, we are here to help. If you have any questions, go to our Discord channel, and we'll be glad to give you a hand. Okay, so with that, I pass the word to Milton. Awesome. I, and I, I just want to say really quick, um, feel free to drop questions in the chat as we as we start going through this. Um, there's also a little uh, question feature if you want to ask them that way. Um, we're also, if you want to raise your hand, we can pull you on stage. You can ask questions live. Uh, and I think we're going to go through this, and then at the end, we'll probably break out into the social lounge, um, into the tables where you could have more time one-on-one -on -one, um, if you have specific questions for, for Milton or Eric, uh, or if you just want to meet other hackers and potentially uh, team up. Um, so without further ado, Milton, uh, take it away. All right. So hi, everybody. So I'm Milton Jonathan. I'm a senior software engineer at Cartesi, and so today I'll be giving you uh, this hands-on session where we'll show you just how you can build a dApp right now using the Decarters SDK that's provided by Cartesi. All right, so uh, just a, an overview of what we're going to cover here. So first I'll do a quick recap on what Cartesi is, what's the general idea, and why we believe it's such a, an interesting solution for building dApps. And then I'll go into a little bit more detail on the specifics of the Descartes SDK itself. How does it work? And what are the building blocks that you need to put together to actually build it? So after uh, we cover that, we can dive into actually making the dApp. So uh, we'll go through some basic stuff like how you uh, initialize a project, how you start up uh, your development environment so that you actually, actually have everything you need to run the dApp. And, and then we'll implement the code, we'll do the code for the dApp itself, we'll run it. And finally, uh, we'll have some, uh, I'll give you some extra notes and tips on some uh, practical things that you, can, you should know, like getting logs and redeploying your application uh, that you'll probably uh, find useful when you're actually developing the dApp yourself. So uh, in the end, uh, if time allows, we'll have some Q&A. Hopefully, uh, many questions we will be able to answer there. Right. So, uh, first of all, just a, a quick overall vision of what Cartesi is all about. Uh, so, uh, regular dApps on the blockchain, they, we call it layer one uh, dApps. Of course, they do everything on the blockchain, right? So, uh, everything that it needs to compute, uh, all of the data that it needs to store, and uh, uh, any messages and any events that it needs to trigger, and, and the settlement, the effects of uh, the, what the DAP is doing, it, this is all done inside the blockchain, right? So uh, what Descartes does uh, is that uh, the computation part 
can be safely moved off chain. And with that, uh, the computation is freed from having to be run inside a blockchain because if you run it inside a blockchain, you have to reproduce that thousands uh, and thousands of nodes, which is really not efficient. So uh, like other layer two solutions that focus on, on doing that, uh, when you do this, you can really scale your depth in the computational sense. So you can do uh, things that are too intensive or too expensive to do inside the blockchain. But there are some key features that uh, uh, put the uh, Descartes and the Cartesian technology apart from uh, the other solutions. And the thing is that this computation that's run off chain is run in a Cartesian machine. The Cartesian machine is a VM that runs Linux and it runs Linux in a verifiable way. So what does that mean? This means that all the complex logic that you want to put into your computation is much easier to develop because you don't have to use Solidity and the tools that are available now on, on Solidity. You can use any language that you want. You can use C++, you can use Python, you can use Rust, you can use, use whatever uh, can run on Linux, right? And not only that, you don't, it's not a, 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 an issue of just the, the syntax that you're using. You can use the libraries that are available uh, on these platforms. So you can compress files. Actually, you have access to files themselves because you're running on Linux. And the blockchain, you don't have that. So you can read the file, compress it. You can do all sorts of stuff. You can uh, um, do pattern matching things. You can uh, query your database. You can do anything that you would normally do in a mainstream uh, development environment. And the special thing about this uh, Linux computation is that it's verifiable. And by verifiable, we mean that you can prove that the computation that you did is correct and that people can trust it. And this is a huge difference because uh, with that, if you have a single node off chain that is doing it right, you can prove that that computation is right and the blockchain can safely use that computation result for whatever it needs to do. All right. so. Uh, there are lots of, of things that we can do with that, right? So uh, Augusto covered a little bit of this on the last session. I'm just going to uh, glide really fast uh, through this. So this there's an example. So if you have uh, two people playing a game, for instance, it, they can just uh, submit their moves. So one is is building their base, for instance, in this game, and all the, the buildings, all the, the assets they are putting in there. Uh, the other one is doing the same, trying to build a different strategy. And the thing is, these... Uh, uh, information, this data is input into uh, a game simulator or whatever engine that is running inside your Cartesian machine. So when uh, it runs, it gets this input, it runs it inside Linux. So you can use a very complicated simulator if you want, and the result uh, can be verified. So in the end, the blockchain gets the result and he can decide that somebody won the game. He can uh, uh, give them some prize. They can transfer some, some assets, some money, whatever. So uh, this is true for uh, many other applications, right? The, the idea is that you can uh, put some data inside and you can run this uh, thing off chain that can be very complicated and uh, using all sorts of resources. And the result, you can actually verify that it's correct and can be trusted. So you can use this for outsourcing computations. You can use this e even for DeFi services that lots of people put into some data. You can have this engine running inside and out come some uh, result that you can actually take decisions on. All right, so, uh, but how does this really work? So the Descartes SDK works like this. You have a smart contract running on your blockchain. So when it needs to do some complex computation, he will hand it off to some off-chain uh, nodes that we call the Descartes nodes, right? So uh, it notifies those nodes that an, a new computation needs to be instantiated. So one of these nodes will uh, actually do the computation itself and post that back to the smart contract on chain. It will claim that the result is this. The Descartes framework will automatically, the developer doesn't have to, to worry about this, it will automatically take this result and it will hand over for another Descartes node to either accept that or challenge that result. So the other Descartes node will do the, this computation. He will verify it. Normally, if nobody's tampering with the code or trying to cheat or anything like that, he will agree because the Cartesian machine is uh, deterministic. And if you're doing the same thing with the same input, you will get the same output. 
But if somebody is cheating, he can challenge that claim and automatically uh, an, a verification game goes on and Cartesi, the, the Cartes SDK, can prove who's right and validate the result. So with the result validated, the contract could go on and use that for whatever it needs to do in a safe way. So uh, with that covered, I'll go into a little bit more detail on what are the building blocks that we need to really put together to make the dev. So uh, we have the smart contract, which is uh, actually where you're gonna have some uh, methods for external users. So for instance, the, the methods that are, that are clients on the browser using web free or something will uh, interact with your smart contract or another smart contract will use this one. And when it needs to do the computation, what it does, for instance, uh, I need to compute a very uh, complicated uh, mathematical expression that's too expensive to do on the blockchain. How he instantiates a computation on the Descartes smart contract. So he calls the Descartes smart contract, gives him the input parameters that he needs, and the Descartes smart contract will instantiate that computation. It will notify a Descartes node off chain and give him the necessary parameters and do the computation. Inside this Descartes node, you have the other building block that we need to, 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 have, to do for your adapt, which is a Cartesian machine with your complex logic inside. So you configure a Cartesian machine with all that complicated logic for your game simulator or your, for your mathematical expression calculator. So with these two pieces, a non-chain piece and an off-chain piece, you can build your DAP. The Descartes smart contract and the Descartes node infrastructure is ready to go and you can just use it. All right, so uh, before we actually begin building our DAP, I just wanted to uh, uh, give some information for you guys. So you have uh, general documentation, including tutorials available on cartesi.io slash docs. You can just go there and see uh, there are lots of interesting information on the, on the tech behind Cartesi and also uh, many tutorials that you can use to uh, understand and learn how to develop that. Uh, the tutorials are also that you have, they are fully implemented and available on GitHub. So you can just uh, take a look there on github.com uh, slash Cartesi slash Descartes tutorials. And uh, finally, uh, just for you to, to understand, we're going to build a DAP now and we're going to use some tools. So there are some requirements that we, uh, that we need to have so that we can build it. And that's covered in the documentation as well. So we're using Docker, we're using Docker Compose, we're using Yarn for dependency management, and we're using Truffle for actually packing and deploying our DAP on a blockchain. Uh, we also, also expect you guys to have some basic knowledge of Solidity and Ethereum in general so that you can follow up on what we're going to do. That being said, let's code. So I'm gonna um, stop the presentation here and start with some code. Right, so uh, what I'm doing here now is just, uh, I'm, I'm using uh, VS Code. You can use whatever you want, of course. It's just a uh, tool that I like to use. And uh, I have, I'm, I'm in an empty directory here, right? There's nothing in here. And we're gonna start uh, by um, starting up with a, a development environment. So when you're building your dApp, you want it to run somewhere. So you need to have a blockchain, you need to have the, the Cartes nodes and all that stuff. So uh, Cartes already provides a ready to go um, development environment. You can just download it. So you do wget and this uh, uh, address here, it will download a ready to go environment. Okay, so here it is. And then we can just um, track that. There you go. So now we have the environment there and we can just go inside, clear this up, and you can spin it up with Docker Compose. Just type Docker Compose up and there it goes. Right, so there it is, it's running. So with that set up, I will open another terminal here. And uh, next thing we're gonna do is that, uh, actually we can just check what's running with Docker. So um, this is what's running there. So we have a bunch of services. 
And uh, we have Ganache, right? Ganache is a local blockchain instance that we are going to use for our DAP. Um, okay, so now we're going to start our DAP project. First of all, we're going to create a directory for it. I'm going to call it calculator because this DAP is going to just uh, do this complex mathematical expression calculation off chain. This is what it's going to do. So moving inside, next thing we're going to do, we're going to initialize our project. Um, here, I'm going to in initialize it using a Truffle. Truffle is a, a, a tool, a common tool for developing on Ethereum. So initializing it, it will create some uh, some files and directories. So now we have uh, a directory for contracts, migrations, and things like that. Right. What we'll do next is that uh, we're going to edit this truffle config file that it generated just so that we can communicate with our local, uh, 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 local Ganache instance that's running on our local environment. So we can just uncomment this. So you see it's running on localhost here and uh, on this part, which is the default part for Ganache. It's just save it and we should be good to go. We can check that actually. Truffle has a nice console that you can open up. So if it runs, okay. So here is, uh, you, you are connected to development work, uh, uh, network. And we can actually check, uh, for instance, the accounts that are there. So we have two accounts here in this network. And if you go back to our previous terminal, you see that it actually called here ETH accounts. So we are really connected to that. All right. So now that we have some basic initialization set up, we can actually start coding. So uh, the first thing we'll do is the off-chain part. So I'm going to build a Cartesian machine that does the off-chain computation that we want to do for this step. I like to create a separate directory to play with my Cartesian machine. So I just go into that. And uh, uh, Cartesian provides a nice uh, Docker image for you to play around with Cartesian machines. And not by accident, we call it the playground. I'm going to paste the Docker command here on top in this, uh, on, the, on the top of the screen here so that I can explain it a little bit. So the Docker image is called Cartesi Playground. Uh, we're going to just jump into it with Bash. And we got some Docker mumbo jumbo here. This is basically uh, mapping the current directory inside and using my current user so that any uh, files that I generate will be reflected on the external file system uh, under my user, right? So if we get this and run it, I'm going to clear this up here and run it here. We're inside the playground. All right. So inside the playground, we have access to the Cartesian machine uh, command. And as I was saying in the, in the introduction, Cartesian machine uh, is a VM that runs Linux. So when we run it, it actually boots a Linux uh, distribution. And we can then execute whatever command we want. So you get the splash screen for the Cartesian machine. It executes that command, which is ls, and halts and quits. OK, so this is a Cartesian machine running. Um, we can actually show a little bit more that it's running Linux. And uh, we can do an interactive section. We can dive into a shell so they can see that this is really Linux inside. So when we get in, we inside, the LS is the same thing as before. And you can use whatever tool you want to use in your Linux environment. So there are lots of tools that are built in, most Linux distributions. And of course, you can also add your own. So for instance, um, I'm going to do a computation here, a, a calculation using the BC tool, which is uh, normally available in most Linux distributions. So I'm just going to uh, create an expression here, 2 to the, the power of 71 plus 36, etc. And I'm going to pipe that into the BC tool that's available in Linux. What it does is that it spits out the result of that computation. So this is just an example of something that you can 
you that's ready in Linux that you don't have to worry about building everything that you need to use, right? So um, with that shown, we can exit this machine. It's halted and it ends. Um, what we're going to do now is that we are going to build a machine like I was uh, showing in this introduction, right? The machine should receive some input, do whatever it wants to do, and spit out the output so that that can be provided to the smart contract on chain. So uh, I'm going to create an input file, which is will be the same expression that I was using before. And I'll just create a file called input.raw. All right. And a little detail here, technical detail. The Cartesi machine is uh, uh, running on top of a RISC-V uh, instruction set. And it requires any input data, any input drives that are going to be mounted on it to be uh, multiple of 4K. So we have a, a tool inside the playground that we can use to actually uh, pad any file that we're going to use so that it has 4K inside. So it can be used by our Cartesi machine. I'm going to also create a 4K output file where the output will be placed, right? All right, so now if we take a look at this, we have 4K sized input and output. And of course, the input has a mathematical expression that we're going to evaluate. All right, so now I'm going to specify a machine that does exactly the computation I want to do. Uh, reading the input from an input drive that we call it and writing the output to an output drive. So here on top, I'm going to just place a command so that I can explain it a little better. So first, I'm going to introduce these two lines here. We call it a flash drive, which is actually a, a device that's going to be mounted on your Linux system. So we have the first one that's called the input. It, of course, has a length of 4K, as we had uh, defined before. It could be bigger than that, but al always a multiple of 4K. And uh, I'm going to specify that it's going to read from this file, which we just created, right? And we're also going to have an output drive called the output. And it is going to write to this output.raw file. I also add this shared command here, which is actually a Cortez machine by default. It won't change any external files. But if we add this shared, it, it will do that so that we can have uh, the, the results reflected on the underlying file system. And finally, the command, right? Instead of just ls, we're going to do some more right here. So this is the complex logic, right, in our example depth. So we're going to use another uh, Linux tool, which is dd. This uh, is a tool that allows us to read bytes directly from any file, any device. So it uh, defines here, I'm defining here the input file as flash drive input. That's uh, another tool for the, from the playground, from the, the from the, the tool chain that we provide in there that allows you to uh, read whatever device was mounted when you uh, attach it, this input drive there. So we're going to read the bytes from there. And instead of just piping it directly, we're going to do just a little trick here, which is I don't want to send the entire 4K into the BC2 because it necessarily is, it knows how to, to handle all those paddings. So I'm going to use a, a very tiny Lua script. Lua is also already included in the Cartesian machine. You can just use it directly. It's going to read the entire 4K file, but it's going to trim it. This, uh, this Z string here is going to trim it as a null terminated string so that we only get uh, the expression that we want to evaluate. Just a little trick. And we pipe this into the BC command, right? The output of that BC. Uh, command will be then directed again to DD, which will use, be used now for writing to the output drive here, right? So if we run this, we can actually just run it. And we'll see the Cartesian machine executing. So it's going to map the, the input and it's going to write to the output. So here we see actually DD reading data and writing data. And if we take a look now, what we had, 
in output raw, which is the output drive, we get the result of the mathematical calculation. All right, so this is uh, the same thing that we were showing in the presentation, right? You get some inputs, you put it inside a Cartesian machine, it has some arbitrary, arbitrarily complex logic inside. In this case, it's not that complex, but it could be. And it spits the output into an output drive. So this is useful for you whenever you're developing a DAP because you can test things. So this is how the Cartesian machine should work. You, sh you can test many other inputs and outputs, see that it's behaving as you want it. So once you do that, we're going to build what we call a Cartesian machine template. Why we call it a template is because uh, it's not the actual run. We are going to define how the computations should be done, but not do it, right? So in order to do that, we are going to do a couple of things. First of all, we are not going to specify an input or output file. I'm going to leave it like this kind of blank, right? So what will happen here is that the Vicartis framework will by itself uh, write the input there and read the output there from, from there. So uh, the smart contract, when it defines uh, the parameters for input, the Descartes will automatically put this inside the Cartesian machine that template that we are specifying here. Aside from that, in order to have a real template, I'm going to add some a couple of extra parameters here, which are, which are first, this max n cycle equals zero means that uh, if if you sit down here, there's a number of cycles, computational cycles that the 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 machine executed. We're going to tell him to uh, the, that the max cycle is should stop at zero. It means that you build the entire machine and then don't do anything. Just hop there. Uh, the second command here is an initial hash command, which is just for him to print uh, the in hash for the initial state of the machine. What does this mean? As I was saying before, a Cartesian machine has a very special uh, property that it's verifiable. And how is it verifiable? It's because you can inspect the entire state of the machine, all the registers, all the data from the drives, either input or output, all the, the information that's in memory, everything can be inspected and you can build a hash from that. And this hash uh, works like a fingerprint for your computation, for the entire state of, of your machine. So if we stop it at cycle zero and get the hash of that state, that's the fingerprint for the initial state of your machine. And this can be used uh, later on to actually kind of identif identify this template, right? So I want to perform the computation. I can give the initial state that I want because this uh, encompasses the entire, uh, all the drives, all the inputs and outputs and everything that I'm expecting, especially the command here that I'm going to run and any other uh, data that I already preloaded inside the machine. The third command that we're going to add here is store. So store will get this in entire state of the machine and actually write it to disk because the, the initial hash is just the hash of the state. You can't really run anything from that, but uh, we're going to write the entire state as files so that the Descartes nodes can run uh, the computation from that template. All right. So when we do this, I'm going to run this thing. And we're going to store it in this directory here called stored machine, right? So I'm going to run this. It's going to initialize everything that it's going to, uh, that it needs. And then it's going to halt and store the machine into the specified directory. Right. So this here is the initial hash that we asked him to print. So on cycle zero, this is a hash, and this can be used to identify this template, right? And then he said storing machine. So uh, if you take a look, we now have uh, the stored machine directory here. And if you look inside it, we get these files here. So these files represent everything that's inside that uh, Linux system. So you get some bigger files here. This is the Linux kernel. Uh, you don't need to worry too much about this. Uh, this would be actually the root file system, anything that you loaded inside your machine. But the interest 
of uh, what interests us here is these two files here, which are 4K inside in size and actually correspond to the input and the output drives respectively. So the only interesting thing for you to see here are these uh, numbers here, these names here, which are actually the address of these drives. And this will be useful when we want to specify exactly uh, the input data and then read the output data from our smart contract. So that's just take note of that, those numbers. Right, so now we have a stored machine, right? We can use another tool just to um, check that the stored machine is what we expect it to be. So we can check that the hash is that one. All right, so this is a hash. We are right. And this, and then we can, uh, we need to do a very special thing. We have the stored the template and we need to make it available to the, the Carter's nodes that are running off chain. So uh, if you recall, on our development environment, we uh, spinned up some Descartes nodes. I actually didn't uh, show you exactly, but we have two nodes running there. If we do it like this, you see, so we have a bunch of uh, things running here for Bob, which is one guy, and Alice would be the other guy who's going to be interested in the computation. So what we're going to do here is we need to move uh, this data in a, to a place that the Descartes nodes can actually use. How we do that, we simply copy um, this information to a very special place inside. Oh, sorry. We need to get out of the playground. Out of the playground, we see the sword machine here again. And we're going to uh, put those data inside this machines directory here from the, the Carter's environment. So let's copy this. And it actually needs to be named after the hash, right? So that we can identify. So if I want to do a computation that's uh, identified by this hash, he knows where to find the files. So, okay, now we have the files all inside our development environment here, right? So after we do that, we are ready to go uh, regarding the off-chain part of the dev. So we already did everything we needed to do off-chain. These nodes are running there. They have access to the stored machine template that at any point uh, the Descartes contract on-chain on can trigger. Right. So now we can move on to the on-chain part of our dev. To do this, um, We'll start by creating a contract. So our smart contract, we'll call it calculator.sol, right? And uh, we're going to throw in here some uh, boilerplate from uh, Solidity, right? So you need to have um, some pragma directive here saying what subversion solidity you're using, things like that. Um, here you see that I'm going to import, uh, the Descartes interface. Now for that to work, we need to actually add dependency, right? So, um, clear things up down here and I'm going to use yarn to add, uh, the dependency to the Descartes SDK package. So when I do this, he'll download the Descartes SDK and any dependencies from that. Let's give it some time, all right. So it downloaded that. And I'm also going to, to take the opportunity to uh, add a dependency to the Truffle contract package, which will be useful afterwards for deploying the dev. So this downloads a bunch of, thing, of things from Truffle. And well, while he's doing this, I'll explain a little bit on top here. So uh, we are importing the Descartes SDK and Descartes interface. And here we are just uh, specifying a con in the constructor of our contract, what is the address of the Descartes smart contract, right? We need to know the address of the contract in the specific network that we are using so that we can actually call that contract, right? 
So uh, now that we have this, I'm going to save the file. Uh, we can actually check that everything is working, right? As expected, the dependencies are in place and all. So we can just use, use Truffle to compile it. Let's see if it works. So Truffle is going to compile. It's compiling calculator as well as the default migration uh, contract. And it compiled successfully. All right. He placed some warnings here, which is because of the experimental features that we are we have on. Right. So now that we have this, we are going to actually start coding our smart contract. Uh, I'm going to start with some definitions. So um, I'm going to open some space here, and I'm going to place this code here. So this is just the definitions that we will have to, we'll have to have to actually instantiate the computation. First of all, we'll need to know the hash of the template machine that we just created. So this is crucial. Without this, we the, the Descartes node won't won't know which uh, computation you really want to run, right? So aside from that, we'll have uh, the input and output drive positions, which are those numbers that we saw earlier. Uh, so uh, the first drive is the input drive, so it's, it's a position at this address, and the output drive is is here. This is used by Descartes so that, as I said before, instead of reading the input from a file and writing to a file, he knows uh, which address he needs to use to uh, uh, give the input to the machine and then read the output from there. Um, just some, some other uh, definitions that we're going to use. So I'm just limiting here the maximum side of the mathematical expression that I'm going to uh, accept as input. This is more of an uh, on-chain limitation that we want to, to place. We could do be whatever. Uh, usually, uh, the on-chain code will be more worried about placing this kind of, of limit. So we actually specify uh, the log2 size, right? So here is 32 bytes for an input. And for the output, I'm allowing up to 2 to the 10 would be 1k of characters for the output. And finally, some other definitions. So I'm defining here the maximum machine cycle that I'm allowing for the computation to take place. This is just a safety measure so that this doesn't run forever. And also, finally, here's some uh, the the maximum time that we allow for uh, the Cartes node to respond. Because some, sometimes if a uh, uh, Descartes node wants to cheat or doesn't want to uh, issue the result because it won't be good for him, he can just uh, try to stall the computation, not doing anything. And this is to place a limit on that. Right. So now that we've defined uh, everything that we need to instantiate the computation, we're going to implement the core of this contract, which is actually just calling Descartes to instantiate the desired computation. So I'm going to create an instantiate function here. Oops. Add this down. Right. So this instantiate method we receive as uh, arguments the address of the claimer and the challenger. So this is actually these are the addresses that are associated with the Descartes nodes that that are going to submit uh, the results. Right. So uh, if you're used to working with Ethereum, you know that anything uh, that you do, you need to um, submit a transaction. You need to have funds for that. So these are the addresses associated with the nodes that the nodes that will be used for uh, submitting those transact transactions. They will usually be associated with the users who are interested in the result of the computation, right? So if you have the, those two users playing to a game, then uh, they will provide nodes. Somehow they will provide the funds necessary uh, for running the computation. But in other topologies, you could have just uh, uh, some organizations that uh, provide these nodes for you. And uh, the, the third uh, argument here will be uh, the mathematical expression itself that we're going to compute. It's going to be the input for our computation. And then, first of all, here, we're going to uh, define the input drive, right? So this is the input drive, the input data that we're going to submit to the off-chain uh, Cartesian machine. So we need to define its position. We need uh, the size of the data, the maximum size of the data that we're going to uh, send. Uh, here, I'm converting the string to, to the bytes array. 
And uh, the last four uh, parameters I'm not going to use here, which is if we're going to use, if you would be go using a uh, logger is a, a feature where you can send bigger uh, chunks of data that normally don't fit in memory in Solidity. And provider is something that's, that's used when uh, the data is not available right away so that the off-chain node will uh, ask for that data. We're not using that either. So uh, the important things here is, are the input position, the data itself, and the size of that data. So now that we define the drive, we can actually instantiate the computation. Though this is where the glue happens, right? Here, I'm telling Descartes, OK, Descartes, please run with this template hash, which is the hash of the computation I want to run. Uh, we have this input drives. You can have many. Uh, here, we're just defining one. But of course, we can define many such input drives. And this is where the output should be read from, the size of the output I'm expecting, and the addresses and the maximum round duration and maximum machine cycle that we defined before. So with this, we can actually uh, instantiate uh, this computation from outside, from uh, the browser, from web free, for instance. So a uh, final note here on this method, you see that here I'm returning uh, whatever the Carter's instantiate returns. Um, this will actually be uh, an index, a number, which identifies that computation instance. So uh, afterwards, to get the result, we'll query uh, Descartes using that index. So I'm going to add here a method that we're going to uh, use to, to get that result. So we're simply going to um, provide that index. Uh, we get when we instantiate the computation, and we'll get the result. Here I'm just forwarding whatever Descartes returns, and we'll see and uh, interpret this, these results uh, later on when we run the DAP. But of course, it will include the, the result when the result is available. All right, so with that, we actually completed the DAP. What we need to do now is that we need to deploy it on our local environment. To do that, uh, since we are using Truffle, you could use other frameworks, right? But in this tutorial, we are using Truffle. We need to create what we call, uh, what Truffle calls, a migration file. So a migration file will be here in the migrations directory. I'll call it deploycontracts.js. And um, we need to have the code that actually deploys the contract, right? I'm not going to go uh, into too much detail in here because this is Truffle. Uh, but basically, we're going to use a contract abstraction from Truffle. We're going to use uh, this Descartes JSON file from inside our environment. OK, so I'm, I'm getting a JSON inside the environment. Why? Because we need the address of the Descartes contract deployed in our local network, right? If we were to use a test net, uh, we could just use this. We could just use uh, uh, the Descartes JSON inside the Descartes SDK package, which already has the addresses of the Descartes uh, contract in several test nets where uh, Descartes is already being deployed. But here we're using uh, the information from our local environment. And then what we simply do is that we call uh, deployer deploy and passing along the address of our Descartes contract, which is in the constructor, right? So this is what it does. With that ready, uh, we can really deploy our uh, that. So we'll run truffle migrate. That's the command for deploying stuff on truffle. So when we run this, we will comp compile things again. And it's deploying uh, the contracts there using the gas from our funds. And it's there. If we take a look at the Docker Compose again, you see the transactions going on here on Ganache. Right. So the contract is there. So now we can run it. We can play with, the, with, the, with our DAP. We'll jump into the console again. Here we are. So we are connected to uh, Ganache again. And here we can use uh, some tools from Truffle. We can actually get uh, 
an abstraction for the calculator instance that's the, actually deployed there. So here it is. And with that, we can actually call our instantiate method. So we're going to do calc instantiate. And we're going to pass along uh, our accounts, right? So we had two accounts, if you recall. I'm going to use accounts zero, accounts one. And now uh, I'm going to pass along the mathematical expression that we are going to evaluate. I'm going to use the same one that we saw before. Just that so that we can check this, if the same result arises. We run that and it's instantiated. How do we know that? Well, first of all, if you take a look here, PX, we have uh, the transaction metadata from our instantiation, instantiation. We can actually go back to our environment and see that lots of stuff are now going on here, right? So you get uh, the services that are inside of the Cartes nodes uh, starting to run. So these, this is the back and forth, right, between the Descartes nodes and uh, the Cartes smart contract on chain. So there will be uh, the Descartes nodes are being notified that they need to compute uh, this uh, calculation, and they are going to send proofs of, of the, 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 the results, and, and this back and forth keeps going on and, until uh, a, a result is claimed, and then another Descartes nodes can uh, validate that. So while we're waiting. Uh, we can, uh, this takes a little bit of a while, like everything does on, on the blockchain, right? And uh, we can actually start checking the results from our get result method. Since this is the first uh, computation, we know that its index is zero. All right. Uh, this is what uh, Descartes gives you as a result. We have four um, variables here. So the first one is just saying that whether we have already a result or not, we don't have it yet. So this false is that. The second one is uh, whether there's something still going on. True, there's something going on. Uh, this index two here is just the address of somebody who is messing up. So if you get some cheating or somebody is not responding, uh, his address will show up here. And finally, this is the actual result. Since we don't have anything yet, um, this is still no. Now, of course, the right way to, to use get result is not by knowing the index uh, beforehand. We actually can inspect the transaction metadata and get that index. So actually, if we take a look here at TX, you see that there's a receipt for the transaction inside and there are some raw logs. So unfortunately, uh, on Truffle, it's a little bit dug inside this receipt, but we can get it. So if we do TX receipt raw logs, index zero and data, this is an actual index, which of course is zero again. But for uh, after you start uh, instantiating several computations, you have an, uh, an arbitrary index, right? So we can do the same again. We can get result, but now passing along the index, we'll still have that. Right, so uh, we still have to wait just a little bit. It should be finishing. Takes like a couple of minutes to finish. Depends a little bit on the computation, but more on the back and forth of uh, Ethereum, you know, the, the blockchain and the, the nodes and the smart contract. Um, I'm gonna just uh, jump ahead a little bit and show you uh, how you can check if everything is okay. So actually, when you're running anything uh, with the Cartes, you can uh, take a look at whatever is running inside uh, the, the services here, right? So you can use Docker to actually check the logs. So for instance, if I do this, I can have the logs for this machine manager, which is a guy responsible for, for running the machine. And we can take a look at whatever he's doing. Let's see if there's an error here. No, there's not, so the thing should be okay. If we go back here, it should be done by now. And there it is. Uh, let me just place it in a better place. So this is the result. So what happened here is that we instantiated computation, the Cartes nodes uh, posted the, the result, another Cartes node validated that, and here we have the result. We can actually in, interpret this. This is the, the bytes for the result. 
and we can um, use, let me just get this um, result here in a way that I can inspect it better. So what we'll do here is that we'll use, uh, I'm gonna print the result using a web free utility to convert the X uh, data to ask, right, the text. So I'm gonna do this. And hooray, this is a result of the computation. So uh, of course, uh, this is a simple example, but bear in mind that you could do a game simulation inside and you get the result here and that's validated by the Cartesian machine off chain, right? So um, this is it. We actually uh, executed the whole thing. So we have a dApp running on a blockchain which it's associating a computation that's been configured inside of the Cartes nodes and you have all the pieces together working. Um, so uh, the other thing that we could go uh, around here is uh, what happens if some, something went wrong. I'm not sure if you uh, uh, have too little time for that, but I'll just uh, give an example here. For instance, if I change the template hash, it's actually fun to see that you can actually uh, redeploy uh, your contract, right? So you can just do migrate again with reset. He'll instantiate the computation again, the, uh, deploy the contract again. So once you get that deployed, you can just uh, run it again. So you need to actually get the contract abstraction, the updated one, and you can run your computation again. So uh, this time, of course, it won't work because it just changed the template hash and you don't have that right there. So uh, if we're gonna check here on the logs, Do this and let's see if there's an error here. Okay, there's an error. So this is important for you when you're developing your DAP. You can check the logs to see if something's gone wrong, right? So he's saying here, unable to open uh, the data from this directory because of course, this is not a valid machine. We haven't deployed this machine with this hash on our local Descartes uh, environment. So uh, this is just a tip for you guys. If you have any problems, you can take a look at the, uh, the logs, and if that's still uh, something uh, hard for you to understand, you can send those logs over to, to us and we'll help out. We know we are uh, uh, just starting off here, and we know we'll have questions for us. So talking about questions, I guess uh, I can stop here, right? And uh, we can go into the q and I guess. Awesome. Thank you so much, Milton. That was, uh, that was very in depth. It, some of it went over my head, but I really appreciated the, the <laughs> info. All right. So, uh, we should, can we answer some questions here on stage or should we join the lounge? Yeah, uh, I guess Eric, do you want to, to do some final uh, uh, observations? I think it was a great presentation. I don't have anything to add. It was fantastic. All right. Awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, if there's any burning questions you guys want to drop in the chat, we can adjust them now. Otherwise, we can head to the social lounge and just chat on the tables um, as well. I know there's it looks like there's a few people watching on YouTube. So if you guys do have questions, um, hop into the AirMeet link. You should see it in the description um, and you can come hang out on the tables. All right, then. Cool. All right, then let's do it. Let's break into the social lounge. Uh, thank you, everybody who, who joined and stuck around for the full presentation. Um, we'd love to see your face in, in just a moment. So we'll, we'll hop into the tables. And thank you to Milton uh, for the presentation. That was awesome. Thanks, man. Cool.